You've committed a sin and you repented and then you've done it again. And then you repented and then you've done it again. It's by maybe the third time the shaitan is now whispering. This is extremely hypocritical. Keep doing the exact same thing because he does not want you to run back to Allah Azza wa Jal. You know what Imam Nawi Rahmatullah Ali mentions? Even if you fall back into that sin a thousand times, don't stop repenting every single time. There are two qualities that no Muslim has, except they're definitely going to enter Jannah. And he said they are so easy, but those who do them are so few. He said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying SubhanAllah after every prayer 10 times and saying Alhamdulillah after every prayer 10 times and saying Allahu Akbar after every prayer 10 times. Abdullah ibn Amr عنهما, who was narrating the hadith, he said, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam counting on his fingers. And he said, if you do that, that's 150 phrases on the tongue and 1,500 deeds on the scale, on the mizan. And then he said, when you go to bed, you say SubhanAllah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, and Allahu Akbar 34 times. And he said, that will be 100 on the tongue and 1,000 on the mizan. And he said, who amongst you commits 2,500 sins in one day? If you had those 2,500 good deeds that could wipe out those 2,500 sins, how easy is that? So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, how come so few of us do it? How do we miss that? And the Prophet ﷺ said that shaitan comes to you while you are praying and he reminds you about things that you've forgotten and he reminds you about things that are coming up. And so what happens is when you finish your prayer, you rush back to whatever you were doing and you skip the dhikr. And then shaitan comes to you when you're about to sleep and then he lulls you to sleep before you can finish saying these simple phrases of dhikr. That's 2,500 good deeds daily that are missed on the mizan, that could literally be the difference maker for you on the day of judgment. And the shaitan really doesn't want you to say these simple phrases because he knows the major impact this has on your scales on that day. But greater than anything that you say is what you do. And what you do regularly is who you actually are, which is why the next part of the mizan is so significant. Whenever I want to get out of a study slump or essentially begin a study session, I will start by cleaning. I'll make my bed, wipe my desk, take in everything, shower or ghusl if it applies in that moment. I'll perform wudu. Then I'll sit down and recite my dua and start studying. Now, I didn't really think much of it before, but lately, I've been remembering here and there that Imam Malik and a bunch of other um, Muslim scholars have this common practice where they would perform wudu before a hadith recitation. So before a learning circle, a lesson, a lecture, they would clean themselves, purify themselves. Now it could just be a them thing, but hear me out. The Prophet ﷺ once said that the scholars, the ulama, are the successors of the prophets. They don't inherit wealth in the form of gold or silver coins, but they inherit knowledge. Now that is already an indication that we should follow the footsteps of our Islamic scholars. And here's another thing. In Surah Al-Baqarah or chapter 2 of the Quran, in verse 222, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah loves the repentant and the clean. The clean. One of Allah's names is Al-Alim. What does that mean? The most knowledgeable. All knowledge comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All knowledge is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literature, poetry, business, economics, maths, physics, and everything in between, it all comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to study or to seek that knowledge in a state of impurity or uncleanliness can be viewed as disrespectful. All knowledge comes from Allah and He loves the clean. So if we clean ourselves, purify ourselves before sitting down and studying the knowledge that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah the processing fluency of said knowledge would be a lot easier. There's a little anecdote from my life, okay? When I was form 4, I started practicing the maintenance of wudu. So I was actively trying to maintain myself to be in a state of wudu. Whenever I think about that year, it was 2018, whenever I look at that year, my experience in retrospect, I will never forget how easy it became for me, alhamdulillah, to process knowledge, to process information, lessons in class. My understanding skills, my memory skills, my thinking skills, deduction, reasoning, critical thinking, cognitive skills, whatever you want to call it, 
My academic performance improved substantially, not just on paper, but I felt it in here, and I felt it in here. So that's a practice we can take on, maintaining wudu. Not only are the benefits just in academics and just in seeking knowledge, but the benefits of cleanliness on its own is both internal and external, and you know it manifests in every aspect of our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the repentant and the clean. There's a hadith in which Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, be in this world as if you were a stranger or a traveler. And the person who narrated this hadith, Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, added to say, if you survive till evening, do not expect to be alive in the morning. And if you survive till morning, do not expect to be alive in the evening. Take from your health for your sickness and take from your life for your death. So this hadith can be found in Sahih Bukhari, book 81, hadith number five. What's beautiful is I think we've started to realize through Ramadan that our purpose on this earth is to connect with the deen. And so this advice from the Prophet is useful no matter which day you're reading it. Treat your time on this earth as if you're a traveler or as if you're a stranger, meaning this isn't our home and this isn't our final destination. We can't allow our heart to get so attached to this world. That being said, Today we're going to cover three short surahs in the Quran. And the first one I think captures this topic really, really well. The first is Surah Takathur, which means competition. This is chapter 102 in the Quran and there are only eight verses. In this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Competition for more gains diverts you from Allah until you end up in your graves. But no, you will soon come to know. Again, no, you will soon come to know. Indeed, if you were to know your fate with certainty, you would have acted differently. But you will surely see the hellfire. Again, you will surely see it with the eye of certainty. Then on that day, you will definitely be questioned about your worldly pleasures. So those first two ayahs, competition for more worldly gains, diverts you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until you end up in your graves. There is no question that by focusing your attention, your energy, to acquiring wealth and acquiring material things in this world is a distraction from the focus you should be putting towards the akhirah. There is a hadith by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which was narrated by Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "As the son of Adam grows old, so also does two things: his love for wealth." and his wish for a long life. And that's also in Sahih Bukhari, book 81, hadith number 10. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam literally warned us, as we get older, as we build attachment to this world, we're going to have these desires to build wealth. We're going to have these desires to live a long life. But this can't be the purpose of our existence. We were not meant to build attachments to this world. So that being said, we're going to move to Surah Zalzala, which is chapter 99 in the Quran, and this one only has eight verses as well. So Zalzala means earthquake, and this chapter is specifically referring to the earth's final earthquake, which will happen during the end times. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the earth is shaken in its ultimate quaking, and when the earth throws out all its contents, and humanity cries, what is wrong with it? On that day, the earth will recount everything having been inspired by your Lord to do so. On that day, people will proceed in separate groups to be shown the consequences of their deeds. So whoever does an Adam's weight of good will see it, and whoever does an Adam's weight of evil will see it. So I want to hone in to ayah number two, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the earth will throw out all of its contents. In the tafsir by Ibn Kathir, there's a hadith in Sahih Muslim, and it was narrated by Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the earth will throw out the pieces of its liver. Gold and silver will come out like columns. A murderer will say, I killed for this. The one who broke the ties of kinship will say, for this I severed the ties of kinship. And the thief will say, for this I got my hands amputated. Then they will leave it there and no one will take anything from it. So not only will the earth be able to recount its own story like it says in verses 4 and 5 when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on that day the earth will recount everything having been inspired by your Lord to do so, it will quite literally relieve its contents. And of those things that it spills out is going to be the gold and the silver and the material goods that we have been fighting our entire lives for, but we should know serve no actual benefit for us on the day of judgment. And the Surah also tells us on that day, we're going to be split into groups, those destined for paradise and those destined for hellfire. 
and that we will be able to see an account of every single thing we good, be it an atom's weight of good or an atom's weight of evil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow our scales to be tipped in our favor and allow us to be destined for paradise on that day. Allahumma ameen. And just really quickly, even that second to last ayah that mentions an atom's weight of good, we know that there are some really small deeds you can do that will save you from the hellfire, inshallah. There's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, book number 24, hadith number 21, in which the Prophet wasallam said, save yourself from hellfire even by giving half a date fruit in charity. Half of a date fruit, half of a timir that we break our fast with every single day, giving just half of one as charity could save you from hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to reap the benefits of our continued sadaqah, Allahumma ameen. So the final surah I wanted to talk about today is Al-Qari'ah, which is chapter number 101 in the Quran, and there are only 11 verses in this chapter. This word means calamity or striking disaster, and this is one of the names we use to describe the day of judgment. To describe this day, Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the striking disaster, what is the striking disaster? And what will make you realize what the striking disaster is? It is the day people will be scattered like moths and the mountains will be like carded wool. So as for those whose scale is heavy with good deeds, they will be in a life of bliss. And as for those whose scale is light, their home will be the abyss. And what will make you what that is? It is a scorching fire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in this chapter in the same way he did in the last chapter. This day is going to be a fearful day. We will be scattered like moths and there will be disasters across the earth. And on that day, we will be held accountable for every single thing we did on this earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it incredibly simple for us to understand. For those whose scale is heavy with good deeds, they will be in a life of bliss, which means Jannah, inshallah. As for those whose scale is light, meaning there are not a lot of good deeds on their scale, their home will be the abyss. And he tells us that abyss is the scorching fire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us on that day when there is no shade but his shade. And may he allow us to come to terms with the fact that this earth was not meant to be our home and there is an ultimate goal we should be working towards. Allahumma ameen. <laughs> يا تارك الصلوات قل لي إن الحياة بلا صلاة موت فيا مسكين صلي قل لي لماذا قل لي لماذا قل لي لماذا لا تصلي الله يصلي احسن لك الله يسعدك صلي في عبارة حلوة يقول لك صلي قبل أن يصلى عليك يا الله لا صلي قبل أن لا يصلى عليك أصلا اللي ما يصلي بعد يصلي عليك أصلا اي والله ولا يقبر في مقابر المسلمين الله يسعدك العهد الذي بيننا وبينهم الصلاة فمن تركها فقد كفر يقول لك أعظم جرم يعترفون به اهل الكفر وهم في النار انهم كانوا لا يصلون يا الله نعم اول جرم وايضا ذكرها الله سبحانه وتعالى في سوره الدف سلككم في سقر ايش يقولون قالوا لم